New Mexico has a rich agricultural history here in the Rio Grande Valley, and farming is not just a thing of the past. What role can New Mexico play in a conversation across the country about local food and farming? Our producer, Sarah Gustavus, sat down with Dan Barber. He's a chef and author of the book, The Third Plate, to talk about the evolution of the farm to table movement. Dan Barber, thanks for being here today. Thank you. Your book, The Third Plate, you talk about the farm to table movement, which you're involved in as a chef. It's something that's very popular here in Albuquerque. We're seeing more farm to table restaurants, uh, local foods in schools, in markets. But you have some critiques of the farm to table movement. Why do you want to challenge that idea? Well, I have some critiques. I mean, I should also say I'm, I'm very much a farm to table chef. I, mean, I, have, a, I have a farm to table restaurant. Actually, I have, a, I have a restaurant in the middle of a farm, so I've very much have a skin in the game here. But what I started to realize in the research for the book that I wrote, The Third Plate, uh, which started out as, as an ode to this movement, this exciting social movement that you're talking about, that's sweeping the country and continues to gain this momentum that's, that you know, is very exciting uh, for the future of good food. But what I, what I realized is that farm to table, at least the way we practice it, going to the farmer's market, picking out the tomatoes or the zucchini, or the eggplant that we're about to come into this time of year, and going back home and cooking that meal and calling ourselves devoted advocates for this 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 social movement is a little crazy because it 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 shortchanges what actually needs to happen in terms of of engagement with this movement, and and it's really a deeper involvement uh, that helps us understand what a farm or farming landscape or farming community needs to sell to be truly sustainable and, 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 and eat from the whole farm, which is really, I think, the goal, instead of cherry picking the ingredients we most want to eat. What are some things that you think could be on our plates that aren't right now? Uh, well, look, the, the, in, in many ways, people are talking about the off cuts of meat that, uh, you know, we all love the rack and loin and the, 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 the steaks, uh, the chicken breast, but, but what about all the other cuts of meat, the lowly cuts? that aren't as popular, more difficult to cook, sometimes more difficult to chew, but have in great flavor and great traditional recipes attached to them. And so that has been gaining steam. What I started to look at was that philosophy writ on a landscape. And, and a lot of that is, is, is leguminous crops, especially here, that, that allow nitrogen to be fixed into the soil and give you those tomatoes and eggplant zucchini that you, you ultimately want to celebrate in the summer. Uh, so legumes is a big one for here, um, uh, cover crops, figuring out how can we uh, 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 both pay the farmer to, to invest in cover crops, and that's really giving the land a little bit of a rest and allowing disease cycles to break up, allowing moisture to be retained. But then, then how can we snip, for example, a great cover crop we use in the East Coast is uh, mustard greens. And you use it out here too, I heard. And so mustard greens, when they first come out of the ground, they're delicious in a salad. And so can we pay the farmer to grow the mustard green for the soil and take a percentage of it for us and thereby creating an incentive for the farmer to grow more of it? That's, that's whole farm cooking, I think. That's really an expansion of the nose to tail ideal. What are some things that have surprised you on your visit here to New Mexico? I know you went to Los Poblanos Farm in the yeah. North Valley. What did you see? First, I saw some incredible farming. Um, I saw incredible landscape traditions uh, and, and really a community around food. And, and that's ultimately what makes me so excited is, you know, you can visit a great farm and farmer, uh, but if it's not connected to a restaurant or, or the larger community, if it doesn't uh, bleed into the, 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 the sort of everyday food culture, which is what I saw at Los Poblanos, um, then ultimately I don't think it has a shot at lasting. And, and that's a very sort of cynical look because there are a lot of farmers who are just, you know, off in their own stretch doing their own thing and, you know, are popular because they sell at a farmer's market or whatever. But what I see in Los Poblanos, what I see the opportunity here is that, that it, there's a connection between the land, the history, which is really important, and, and the community that wants to repatriate some of those lost traditions and bring them back really in the pursuit of, of great flavors and, and interesting cooking. And, and to me, that's, that's, a, that's a winning formula for this movement because it puts the pieces together. We definitely have the, you know, those Native American and Hispanic traditions yeah. that people are trying to revive here. You also make an argument that meat shouldn't be such a large part of our plate. 
not only in our perception of what's what a good meal is, but literally on our plate. Yeah. Are you saying we can't eat steak dinners? No, I'm, I actually love steak. I'm a, I'm a defender of steak. I'm just not a defender of steak uh, uh, twice a day, seven days a week. Like, so I, I don't think the, the architecture of our plate should be a, a hulking piece of protein, whether it's a steak or, or a chicken breast or, or a center cut piece of fish, and then a smattering of like vegetables and grains to sort of accompany it. I mean, it, 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 first of all, it's really not the most delicious way to eat, as we know, because if we look at the great cuisines of the world, there is no cuisine that allows you to eat that way because the carrying capacity land doesn't allow you to eat that way. America is this crazy anomaly, and we, we have been exhausting resources to get that, fulfilling that architecture and that expectation. And that, I think we need to flip it on its head. I think we, they, but we need to eat meat. And meat really, I think, in most ecologies really serves a great purpose. But we needed to eat it in, in relationship to what the land can produce on that meat and, and eat more grains, more legumes, and more vegetative crops with a suite of diversity that, that corresponds to what the landscape wants you to grow. That, by the way, is not an ecological argument, although it is. It's not a nutritional argument, although it is. It's not a community activist argument, although it is. It's really about, about great flavor. And as a chef, that's, that's my primary interest. I was interested in your book that you say that America doesn't have a cuisine, really. Maybe, maybe the South. You made an argument for the South having a cuisine, which I think maybe we could make an argument for I, I was going to say, <laughs> after I said that, you were, you, that was last night. Now, this, now here I am late this morning, and I've, my position is evolving. <laughs> that. No, I, I see the, the, you know, the, the, the history and, and of Native Americans and what, there's so much knowledge. Uh, it's really knowledge-based farming because out of its deprivation, I mean, we're looking at the desert here. And, and that kind of desperation deprivation leads to some really interesting both seed development, um, uh, 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 wisdom, heritage wisdom, that, that ends up producing truly delicious food. So is it a cuisine? Yeah, there's, 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 there's peaks of that that I saw that are, 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 I'd like to come back here and explore them more. What do you think the role is of chefs in this conversation and leading um, a change in how we think about the foods we're getting from farmers, um, increasing demand for that, maybe making some of those cover crops and foods that we haven't thought of before yeah. popular yeah. in restaurants. Yeah, I think chefs are huge here in restaurants. And, and any, I mean, look, it's, any, it's really any uh, institution that is serving food and fresh food uh, because that, that has the ability to, to curate this stuff. You know, it's sort of like, uh, like the leader of an orchestra, you know, the conductor. Uh, you know, you've got all these ensemble things going on, but to, to have it work harmoniously, which is really about cooking the whole farm, or, or I'm calling it a third plate philosophy, but it's really about putting the pieces together, you need some entity that, that forces that. Can you do it at home? Yes, but in our harried, overextended lives, doing more than simply getting dinner on the table is really tough to do. Uh, especially in, in this day and age. And, and the, the nod to reality is, you know, we, we do spend more and more of our dollars out to eat. And, and if we can focus those dollars on, on going out to eat and, 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 and thinking about our menu in more thoughtful ways, I think chefs would respond, and chefs are responding, are sort of leading this, pushing this, because it's where the best food is going to come from and where they're going to have the most satisfied uh, diners. So I think that's the future of good food, and I see it here just beginning to blossom. And when I say just beginning to blossom, I don't mean that the farm to table, you know, the, 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 the connection with farmers is a starting here. No, but a deepening of that relationship and a deepening of the respect for the land. And, and what the wisdom of, of, our, of the people who were here before understood quite well and passed on through the generations. We can't lose that. In fact, we have to both take that wisdom and modernize it and bring it up to date. That's, that's a very exciting food culture future. Like a lot of Western states, we have a water problem <laughs> with access to water and, yeah. and looking ahead to the impacts of climate change. Is this part of a complex conversation about how we're going to address a changing climate? Yeah, yeah, definitely, for sure. I mean, all of this is about changing climate because, because ultimately in, in repatriating these traditions and these seeds, it's really important, the seeds, because the seeds are, are tolerant to low water use. So if you can repatriate, if you can grab those genetics, bring them up to date, meaning that farmers can grow them and actually make a, a real living on them and they can be uh, uh, modernized to the point where they're, they're resistant to, to current pest problems and the like. You're, you have a shot at, 
at utilizing the landscape and producing the best, most delicious food. And that's, you know, that's why looking back to the past is so important for these upcoming problems, these ecological issues, uh, and these fraught environmental uh, pressing problems that we, we have on us now and are only going to compound as we move into the future. So I, I look at that and, and it does feel overwhelming in some ways. And then in others, I'm here just at Los Palmas this, this morning and talking to some people last night. There's such energy and passion and drive to, to figure out how in this, in this world of increasingly limited resources do we push food culture and food forward. That's a, that's a very exciting possibility. I can't wait to come back and see what happens. You talk to some really interesting people in your book and, and went out and learned from them. They're doing that work in the field. They have that knowledge that even though we have access to so much information on the internet, in books, in so many places, it seems like there's really something valuable about talking to people who are actually building up that knowledge that yeah. they need to then pass on. It's a great on. point. You know, no one's ever said it to me because you know, a lot of the people that I talk to, you could find this stuff on the internet. It's true. You could research, but what is it? It's about these, these, these engagements and seeing the land and, and digging very deep into their ideas that, that become really felt. And then, you know, from that, this, this third plate idea came to me. I, it doesn't happen through just reading, uh, you know, articles about some of these farmers on the internet, but it's a great point.